Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Paul from uh, Public Mint. I'm CEO at Public Mint. I'm really happy to be here uh, with this conversation with Adam. Hello, and welcome to Reimagine 2021. This is our ninth conference and a monthly series of events bringing you nothing but the best projects, bright minds, and leaders in the space. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to invite many talented individuals and teams to come speak with us, providing updates, insights, and all the above that's happening in crypto. Um, I'll be your host today, Adam, from the Mouse Bell team, where we focus on early stage uh, investments through our accelerator or providing development support to a number of growing projects, as well as education uh, within our Mouse Bell University program. Um, our main objective and goals are pretty simple. It's increasing adoption, use cases, and real world applications. Uh, we seek to educate our audience on, on blockchain by helping them understand crypto's real impact. So again, thank you all. If you've been following us for the last year, uh, it's kind of been pretty exciting. Uh, the demand has been great. Uh, the, the people that we're interviewing are just getting better and better. And uh, today's uh, going to be uh, nothing short of that. So uh, Paulo Rodriguez, CEO of Public Man, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. Very happy to be here. Thank you for, your, for the invitation. Awesome, awesome. So we were just talking a little bit earlier. Uh, you're, you're calling from uh, from Portugal, and we were chatting a little bit. Maybe you could shed a little bit of light. You know, this is kind of an international. Um, uh, we share this across various platforms, international, all over. People view this from I don't know t ten plus countries. And what's the scene like, kind of where you're at out in Portugal, the crypto scene? Well, the crypto scene here in Portugal is really vibrant. Um, you know, I was talking about it earlier. So we have this crypto friendly regulation in Portugal. So as a matter of fact, we happen to have a lot of people coming in from other geographies living in Portugal, which means that you have very interesting, talented, talented people here. And we have very interesting discussions uh, from Bitcoin maximalists on one side. You have corporate people on the other side and we all get together and get really interesting discussions on how to move forward within this environment. Awesome, awesome. And, and your project will get into that because it does touch on the crypto side and it touches on kind of the corporate traditional side that, right. uh, yeah. you know, that, that I've read, you know, with Public Mint is some of the problems really in the crypto space and the projects that are coming out to, to diversify, right, and, and kind of reach the masses. So, so let's talk about, well, first of all, everybody has a great journey um, into blockchain. Everybody had felt some rabbit hole years ago, two days ago enthusiasts we have a lot of developers tuning in a lot of students uh but not only that we have you know investors we have other leaders of projects like that are either participating that are viewing this right now so talk to me a little bit of kind of your your crypto path uh in, into into the space yeah so so I, I used to work for a clearinghouse and payments processor for over 15 years and and i went through the card schemes like visa mastercard and domestic scheme and was also at a certain point in time responsible for the ATM um, development of applications on the ATM network. But at, at a certain point, I was responsible for the SWIFT connectivity of the Portuguese banks to the SWIFT network. Wow. We call it the uh, uh, SWIFT Service Bureau, which enables basically all the plumbing of the banks, of the Portuguese banks to the SWIFT network and to the real-time growth settlement systems uh, at the European Central Bank. And it was effectively when I was managing that that the mission critical system that I came across blockchain. It, this was roughly around the Mt. Gox uh, event, so a few years ago already. And at that time, the shareholders uh, were just asking me, "Look, what is this Bitcoin? Is this a threat to the banks? What's going to what's going to happen?" And it was my responsibility to give them. Uh, a view on how would that uh, play out according to the SWIFT connectivity, to the cross-border remittances uh, kind of use case. So they were a bit concerned, and I was responsible for doing that research, and maybe even created some working groups with the banks. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, this crowd is quite conservative, and I've, I've tried my best to educate them and to bring them on board, but still. Uh, so I decided to move, move uh, into the startup world, uh, I, I worked for, I helped create a, um, an innovation hub and a, and, a, and a blockchain dedicated team in Lisbon for another company before, uh, before embracing the public mint um, challenge. So it was kind of like three years or so when I was very fortunate to meet Halsey Miner 
And just for the for the guys that don't know who Halsey Minor is, Halsey Minor was was the guy that built CNET back in the 90s. So he's the founder of CNET and and is one of the first investors in Salesforce. He he helped Mark Benioff uh, ramp up uh, Salesforce. So this to me was really an honor and a privilege to to meet Halsey and to be able to to have his mentorship. He had the vision. Uh, uh, um, uh, an idea that he wanted to fulfill. Uh, at the same time, I met uh, George Pereira, who's the CTO uh, of uh, Public Mint. George and Halsey already had worked together building Uphold. I don't know if you if you heard about Uphold. Yeah, Uphold is quite a, a successful project out there, and there were some lessons learned out of Uphold. Uphold is is very successful, but. There, there were some things that we could be done in a different direction. And that's where there, the, the three of us came up with this idea of building uh, public men. So this is basically my, my story, how, to, how, how I came to public men, right? No, that's crazy. I used to work for the bank too, and the whole SWIFT and wires and settlements and payments. It's kind of interesting. Like you, you have you know, some true insight into, well, you, you, you know, you know, the thing that the thing that really struck me the most hard to, to understand was really the fact that you have instant settlement already for a long time, but it's only between banks. Yeah. So at the central bank, you have, you have uh, accounts that are from direct participants or indirect participants, but they have instant settlement, but that's something in a closed group, in a closed environment. So there's not, that ability for you and I to do instant settlement. And that was the thing that was really difficult for me to, to, to accept. And that's why I was so, so drawn into blockchain because regardless of the technology and you have different flavors out there, yeah. the whole idea is that you have instant settlement. My money, I can transfer to, your, to you whenever I want without uh, interacting with some kind of gatekeeper that is holding effectively my money. So that's, that's in a nutshell, I would say the, the thing that drawn that that brought my attention into blockchain into this into this industry. No, totally. I think I think there's gonna be a true impact, that peer-to-peer, -peer, right? That peer-to-peer -peer accessibility, um, transaction, um, no middlemen, right? And and kind of working our way. It, it's uh I was just at the Bitcoin conference and uh <laughs> yeah, full Bitcoin and steam ahead, price dips, no dips. Everybody's uh, mo moving forward. That's for sure. So yeah, let's I, yeah. go ahead. So I was just just going to say that it's there's this ideal of a Bitcoin maximalist, and I I've had very interesting discussions with people that are on one extreme uh, position and on the other extreme position. And we at Public Mint, what we think is that we need to find the silver lining, the path in between that makes it available for the masses. It's not, yeah. it's not just about, uh, I don't know, DeFi solutions yeah. that are really interesting, but at the end of the day, they're not available for the normies. They're just available for people that know what a MetaMask is, what the Ether is, yeah. what an exchange is. And we need, to, we need to realize that the world is much beyond those kinds of people. This is a small bubble of crypto um, people, right? So, so, and we, what we're trying to here to, to do is really to bring that innovation for everyone and not just for a, a small set of people. And, and, and let's get into it, I guess. So let's talk about public mint. Um, very interesting project, uh, lo looking it up, reviewing it. Um, I have actually had it come across it until recently. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, let's kind of give some yeah. insight and we'll, we'll kind of go down kind of maybe the, uh, you know, the, the internal workings, I know you guys offer like solutions and, and, and even on the going back to this, this topic that we were just talking about, like you guys do provide outside of this crypto bubble. So before we get into that or, or not the bubble, but, you know, the a lot of projects get stuck uh, within the, the industry and are having a tough time maneuvering. Right. To get to get beyond uh, the current users and, and crypto enthusiasts and, and believers, we do need to get to that second and fourth, you know, second, third, fourth tiers out there. So yeah, let's get into public mid and, and kind of talk about what that is. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, it's a bridge because because you have uh, crypto savvy people that one way or the other have some friction when trying to bring fiat on board and get access to fiat rails and to bank accounts. That's one issue from people that are in the crypto 
uh, side. And you can argue that some of these people already live uh, all in in crypto. They, they don't need to have a bank account. You can argue that. But still, there is the need to get access to the legacy world, uh, so to say. And you have on the other side of the fence people that don't know anything about blockchain, don't know anything about Bitcoin, but they hear things like 10x or like 8%. And they're, they're stuck with a with a savings account where it's less than 1%, right? So there's this disconnect between these two sides. So what we try, what we envision, and this, this started two and a half years ago when we went to the OCC to present our idea, because at the end of the day, we wanted to work with banks, not against banks. So there was, there was no clear explicit say that yes we approve but they didn't say it, we were on the wrong path yeah so basically what we decided was really to move forward and what that that's what that that means is that at the core we have banks so banks hold the money the fiat money like dollars euros uh yens the banks hold the money they are the regulated entities to do so what we do is kind of like what swift did for the banks so there's this technological layer on top of the on top of the custodial structure that works with digital representations of those dollars so you you decouple the ownership of funds from the movements of funds themselves let me give you an example if i were to send money over to you and i will start it from scratch so i go to public mint i create a wallet and i deposit funds there like uh, like a prepaid card I top up my wallet, right? So what happens is that I'm triggering, triggering a wire or an ACH or a credit card into my public mint address. The money is sitting on the bank, one of the banks that works with us. But the digital representation is now available on my wallet, which is on the blockchain side, which means that from now on, I can send money to you directly in four seconds, instant finality, low cost, like five cents per transaction, because you're benefiting from the blockchain, but you're still benefiting from the fact that you're working with a fiat currency. So it's kind of like trying to get the best of both worlds, right? So that that is the whole idea is really to work with banks for the custodial structure, for money, for to for anti-money laundering uh, approach, to do all the sanction screening, to make sure that the money is legit when it comes in. But then when it comes in, it becomes much more powerful than typical money that you have on your bank because it becomes programmable and becomes available to exchange hands instantly. And that's what we believe is going to be a, a game changer from now on. And so what about kind of uh, like key storage and, and is this non-custodial or custodial? Like, is it, do the you users, you choose, wow. You choose. That's great. So, so, so you have the crypto savvy kind of approach where I hold my keys and I want my keys on my side and you, you create your wallet, you download your keys and you have the keys on your side. Or if you're kind of like a normie kind of approach, you don't know what a key is, right? You don't even grasp that concept. So you just want a user and a password and you're logged in. So that's why we've integrated with Google and with Apple in a way that becomes easy for a person to in in interact with the system. Although the keys are being stored on Google Cloud, for example. So you have the security at the same time, but you have a more friendly uh, approach to the, to the usability. And how and how did you navigate these partnerships or these you know external parties that uh, that you're dealing with your Googles, your Apples, as you're mentioning? I don't know some of the other you know credit card processing machines. Uh, you're dealing with uh, what was it? Uh, we have, you know, we some have agents. Prime doing, we have Prime Trust doing the custody of funds. On the, other, on, the, on the trust company side. So you have to uh, find the, the proper path in between. So there's always the concern of uh, operating within the boundaries of regulation, but at the same time, trying to figure out a way of becoming a better service for, for the end user. And sometimes it's not easy. So you, if you are totally in on the crypto side, you have more flexibility, right? Of course. But, but then, you buy into some issues in terms of uh, how to cope with regulation, and and if we work, if we are totally on the legacy side with banks, then you don't have any flexibility at all. So it's kind of like finding the the middle ground. Um, 
how have you seen the evolution of maybe some of the, you know, it was pretty tough to, to onboard, you know, fiat payments and all that. Have, have you seen, and then uh, you, and you mentioned just a, just a few seconds ago of like uh, regulation clarity, compliance clarity. H- have we come along? I know we've come a long ways, but mm-hmm. to what degree have we, uh, there's still, you know, room, or there's still work to do, but have we kind of made a dent in terms of allowing, you know, uh, uh, jurisdictions allowing companies to, you know, flow a little bit easier? Yeah, well, uh, well, I'm biased on this one because due to my my uh, background in payments and working very closely with regulation with regulators in the past, so I fully respect the the uh, the role of the regulator. It's it's really hard to be a regulator today because you you need to you need to give space for innovation. You should not stifle innovation, but at, when you see something bad happening, you need to find a way to protect the customers, right? So it's not easy for the regulator to 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 keep up with the speed that innovation is happening today in the crypto space. But having said that, I think we've come a long way. We've been we've done a lot of effort in different geographies, and you see all the all the CBDC discussion around central bank digital currency, which is quite exciting, right? We, we public mint what we what we are doing is in fact a synthetic fiat version of dollars on chain so it's 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 kind of like the natural path of central banks to go on that route also and find a way to have a central bank digital currency but that doesn't mean that it's a one winner all right you, sh- you should have crypto on one side you should have central bank digital currencies and you should have different flavors for different types of customers so I, I would say that regulators have done their their a good effort in trying to keep up and not stifling too much, but we all also acknowledge that there are there have been some uh, errors in, in 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 the crypto side, some fraud that it, it would be better if we had if we hadn't, but still it's just a fact of life and it's a result of the of the trial and error approach that we have in the crypto space, right? Are, are you a supporter of the CBDC? I think we will get there. Yeah. Maybe not yeah. as fast as people think. Yeah. Uh, there is this catalyst of China because everyone else needs to do something about it. Uh, but it's it's a tough call for, for central banks to move forward into a, a CBDC because there's a lot at stake. The currency is a very powerful tool that people typically don't grasp and don't, don't understand that the currency represents the sovereignty of a, of a country, represents how that country maps into privacy. Uh, there's a lot of issues at play. So I think we will get into that. And I think the crypto space is going to help in giving some examples of how to get there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um. I've seen this concept kind of within the platform in terms of uh, I think you have some integrated concepts of like centralized finance and DeFi. Yeah, is yeah. that right? Can, can you explain a little bit of that? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why we get in, we got into that use case. So we've set up the platform in July last year. It was up and running. Uh, it's it's a it's a fully Ethereum compatible blockchain, but it's a fork in the sense that it's fully fiat native. So it doesn't run on ether it runs on dollars if you want to to transfer money to a friend of yours you transfer dollars and you pay your fees in cents of a dollar there's no ether involved and once again it's simply because we want to make it as simple as possible for everyone to use it without coming up with this friction of trying to understand what ether is and metamask and all that stuff so the system was up and running we started to have a few customers using it for for instant payouts to their providers or to stuff like that but still we we understood that the customers on our network was were stuck with the money there just sitting there right and they had just one option whether i find a partner to transfer funds to pay for products and services or i need to take that money out back into the legacy world and that's obviously not what we want so we tried to figure out what was the low-hanging fruit um, in terms of the next use case. And the next use case is, is an obvious one, is giving some returns on your 
on your money, right? It's kind of like having a checkings account and migrating in, into a savings account, but but in a blockchain kind of style, which means that your money is always available and it's easy to move around. So the that use case we call the earn, and the, and we've we've launched a specific IDO for that in February. There's a light paper this uh, explaining all about the earn app, but you can see it as a as a an application that is running on top of the underlying public mint platform. So you have the underlying fiat native blockchain, and then you have one vertical, which is the earn app. And that means that you have the money on public mint and now you can decide. You can decide to click a button and put that money into earn. And all of a sudden you get at least 68% APY just for the money, just for the fact that you're relocating money into the earn app. Having and what are you holding? That, what, what does one hold when they're earning and what are they earning so they're, they're what the earn app is is it's kind of like a funds manager right it's oh, uh, the comparison is it's just for for the sake of understanding imagine that instead of having an entity that is managing a fund you have uh, a set of people that can uh, vote and say what is the best way to apply that liquidity that's how the Earn app functions. So you have the Mint token, which is a very specific utility token that was created for the for the Earn app, and it means that anyone that holds Mint tokens is in fact a person that can uh, stake their tokens and vote and say to the to the system where the money should be applied. So you have two sides of the equation. You have the normies or the people that don't realize what blockchain is and they just have money on public mint and they click a button and they allocate liquidity and then you have on the other side of the equation the crypto savvy people that have mint tokens then that know where the money should be applied in order to get the best the best earnings out of that and with that you have 80 percent of that uh, earnings going back to the normies and 50 percent going back to the people that did some work and educated the system on where to, to apply the liquidity. Obviously, the, the the destination of the liquidity is not everything. Mm -hmm. So Public Mint does uh, a lot of due diligence and creates a portfolio of options on the Earn app, options that then the Mint token holders will vote upon. And, and those options are C5, C5 providers uh, that we are already working with or DeFi protocols. So there's a, a diversified portfolio of CFI and DeFi in order to have a blended APY that comes back to the to the, the, the owners of the liquidity and to the mint token holders. That's how the Earn app functions. And it's just an example of a very simple application that is running on top of the public mint underlying platform. Others to come in terms of uh, interesting applications running on that. Wow. So that was just the low hanging fruit, right? You have money there. Well, the next step is to get some earnings out of that. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think um, <clears throat> just kind of the whole flow right now is very UI UX. I, actually, how is your UI UX with, with all of these well, solutions? We're, we're going, all of these we're solutions. going to launch, yeah, we're going to launch a, a, um, an app, an Android first and then Apple. And it's, well, you've touched a very important topic, which is all about UI UX. It's all about, once again, reducing friction to the end user. So it's, it's what we want is a button to deposit funds and a button to allocate funds. And that's it. And that, that's how all blockchain applications should be. And, and that's why we think that Public Mint is enabling this bridge in order to have any kind of blockchain. And, and I've seen a lot of interesting innovation in the blockchain space, and they're just stuck there because they're struggling to get into mass adoption. They need to overcome the whole friction of people that don't know anything about blockchain and they don't know how to interact with with, with the blockchain system. So friction is something that should be taken out of the equation as much as possible. Any risk, any risk involved? Anything that a user would have to be careful of? It looks like obviously you can manage your keys, not manage your keys. <laughs> it looks like you're, 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 uh, you know, moving dollar in, right? Which is, yeah. is understandable. Um, it yeah. looks like you could pick and choose uh, or not pick and choose, but you kind of can, you know, you provide a blended option of, of CFI and DeFi. Are there any risks that one needs to pay attention or is it? Yeah, so so 
if you deposit funds into public mint, the money is being, as I said, held in, uh, in uh, trust companies and banks. That means that your money is fully FDIC insured. So that's when the, same, the money that you have on public mint is FDIC insured. And that is very good. And that's I don't great. think that, and I don't, I don't think you see that a lot in, in this space. Not now, when, when, you, when you allocate part of your money into the Earn app, that money is no longer FDIC insured because what we're doing is putting that money into CFI and DeFi protocols. So obviously there is some risk involved and, the, and it's going to be totally explained in, in, the, in the terms and conditions of the people that uh, get onboarded into the app. Um, but what we did was still uh, do the same good practices that banking do, which is minimize the risk by diversifying. So you have different players, different CFI players in order, if one of them defaults, uh, and it might happen, we will do our, all our due diligence, but you never know, right? It's just like a bank. Some banks sometimes default, which is very unfortunate. And in our case, what we're doing is the same thing, is trying to diversify the portfolio and still reserve part of that liquidity into an insurance in order to mitigate that, that uh, catastrophic situation that might happen. But still, there, there is always risk when you try to get some earnings out of your money. And that is very important because, you know, this is just a side note, but the human being is a bipolar uh, human being. On one side, we like to get huge return, but on the other side, we want to be fully protected. And that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> now, that's uh, the complete opposite, actually, yeah. of how it actually works. And, you know, we're kind of talking about the masses. We're talking about adoption. We're talking about utility. Yeah. you know, democratizing like, you know, ex, you know, uh, crypto and finance and banking and all that. Um, I, I don't know if this is on the roadmap. How, how does this play into like traditional businesses, right? We're talking about individuals using this. Is this on the roadmap? Is this down the road where, you know, this year uh, public make can be applied uh, to different, you know, different mom and pops or, or, or corporate yeah, yeah, structures. Yeah. yeah. How, how, what's kind of the lay of the land there? So as, as I said, in the beginning of this conversation, we have banks on one side, very slow to move all the regulation constraints. So they will get into the CBDC discussion, but it will take time. And you have a second stage, which is big corporates, right? And they might be interested at this point to do some interesting POCs or MVPs, just try to figure out there is some risk involved, but they are still stuck in that ROI kind of approach. So what is in it for me for the, for, the, for the next six months? And it's really difficult for them to move into a very aggressive uh, approach like startups. And then you have the startups and you have this interesting um, environment that we have in the blockchain space in different different networks where you have full um, uh, liberty to try it out. So what I'm saying here is that first we will start with startups and those startups will eventually target like B2C solutions, like, like end users. And that will trigger liquidity, that will trigger usage into the system. Then the next step is now that we have a momentum, now we can go to corporates, mid-size, big corporates, and then and then we will get to the CBDC. Because at the end of the day, if you look at Public Mint, the underlying platform, we can perfectly be a provider of a CBDC in a white label approach. That is something that might happen, but not, obviously, not at this stage. That's something that might happen when the time comes. And is Public Mint kind of a, a composable platform too? Is it, can you plug and play? Is it meant, can yeah. others, you know, leverage public mint into their own, like you said, you know, further up the stack, you know, let me, let yeah, me that, that's, stack. that's, I, I have to give it to Halsey. Well, Halsey was the, as I said, was the first investor in Salesforce. So this whole idea of creating Salesforce for money, quote, Salesforce for money, uh, it's the same mindsets, right? So you have Salesforce for data right now. And the same mindset we would like to apply here. So there's this underlying platform well, the com where the, the, the common denominator is programmable money. And then you create verticals. 
Some verticals we might do it ourselves, what, ha what happened with Earn app, because they are so fundamental that can be part of the core portfolio. But we always encourage our community to develop their own solutions on top of public mint. Nice. And we already have examples of that. So we have, for example, we have announced uh, very recently um, um, a situation where it was created a decentralized exchange on top of public mint. And it was completely autonomous. So we yeah. have the open APIs, we have an embeddable widget, people can play with it uh, freely. And that was what happened. So we already have on our sandbox a decentralized exchange that it was completely done by by the, the programmers with yeah. using our open APIs to access money. So so that's where we want to be, is to really support the community. And, and that community will create two types of components. It will create B2B components, say for, his, for example, things like what is my global position on public mint and other networks. That would be a, a nice component to be available on, on our marketplace. Or components like data aggregation or tax reporting, stuff like that, that don't have an UI. But on the other side, you can, you can have things more related to, to end users like DEXs, like IDO platforms, like AI advisors and stuff like that. So there's components that can be delivered to others for usage or you aggregate that on a kind of a money Lego philosophy. And then you have uh, full-fledged solutions to be presented to the end user. So it's, yes, it's fully complex. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and and, and how, what does a governance, kind of your governance mechanism look like for public minute? I know um, you guys have like a couple things going on there. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on how the governance yeah. works or, or, you know, what the purpose of that is for? So, so again, so I, I want to address it in two different layers. So you have the underlying layer, the public mint platform. And that, as I said, is a, is a fork of uh, Hyperledger Bessel. By the way, we, we, we've, we've, we've went through a lot of uh, different solutions before we decided to go for what is called today Hyperledger Bessel. When we, hold, hold, day, hold that though, hold that. Hold, hold that thought, because uh, this is Battle of the Chains. You know, um, uh, ga uh, Battle for the Throne, Game of Chains, Battle for the Throne. And I do want to hold that question because I do want you to talk about kind of that process on the mm -hmm. on on the Hyperledger Ethereum, um, where we're having a lot of we're having a lot of discussions on on projects, layer one communities, on the pros and cons, the advantages. So yeah, I would love to kind of hear that uh, yeah. at some point too. So, so so yeah, so so we went through a lot of them, uh, but at the end of the day, two years ago we decided to go for one that was called Ethereum for the Enterprise. It was called back then uh, Pegasus from Pantheon. It was a startup from Consensus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, then they, they've joined Hyperledger, which was great for us because I already had previous relationships with Hyperledger uh, back when I was working before Public Mint. I was working at a, a, another company that was a founding member of Hyperledger. So it was interesting to see Hyperledger Bessel and we were just using Hyperledger Basin, again, as a fork because it's a dollar native and not uh, based out of Ethereum. So for that governance, currently we run with seven nodes in different, in different geographies, but it's still uh, fully under our responsibility. We have planned um, on our roadmap the ability to evolve to a distributed proof of stake kind of approach in order to have vetted uh, uh, entities certified entities to run nodes, but still at this stage, uh, we we have the network running as it is, and we're currently more focused on building uh, verticals and creating momentum around the platform than moving into the distributed proof of stake. Um, so that's not honestly on our uh, first priorities at this point. That's the underlying platform. In terms of the Earn app, it's truly dis dis uh, decentralized in the sense that uh, the Mint token holders are the ones that decide what the Earn app is going to do. So there's uh, different stages. There's a first stage where, and that's also um, described on the Lightbird. There's a first there's a first stage where we call the shots, uh, and then there's a second stage where we can vet some 
some of the decisions that were made by the community and we hopefully we will get to the third stage where the earn app is fully uh, decentralized and autonomous and and managed by the mint token holders and, and i think that's critical you said a couple of things there in terms of decentralization uh versus you know centralization or just kind of the phases of that like people think it's just decentralized tomorrow right like no it comes in phases you gotta like build it out first make sure everything you know is is cohesive you, 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 don't, put, you don't put an atomic bomb in the hands of a baby right <laughs> no no way no way yeah you, you need to go step by step and and when you when you see that the baby has grown up and is mature enough to understand the pros and cons then okay <laughs> exactly exactly and, and you definitely do have this this hybrid approach why, why was it important to I guess have an uh, uh, if you know ethereum compatible option yeah. and it is now is that also to other EVM mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the two main the two main um, arguments were first community and it's obvious that the whole community in the crypto space is all about ether and ethereum you have others and you have uh, very interesting projects coming out now but still ether is king yeah. uh, and that is one very strong argument to choose uh, pantheon and the second one was really it was focused on the enterprise yeah. and as i said before uh, when we get to the enterprise, that's when things will start to get very, very interesting. And I, I can tell you, for example, when I was working at Swift, at, at the, the Swift Service Bureau, one of the things that was really interesting was to go for the supply chain finance use case. That's something that moves a lot of money in the world because you have big corporates uh, lending and borrowing money and manage their treasury and there's a lot of liquidity uh, pools on the value chain that are locked simply because the system doesn't work efficiently so once we get to that stage and i'm not saying it's going to be tomorrow because we're still at the stage where we're building apps for the end users we're creating momentum and we will gradually enter into the corporates but when they see the advantages of managing their treasury on an instant liquidity kind of approach, then it becomes a really, really interesting game because no longer you need uh, to wait 90 days for your for your customers to pay you. Yeah. You have your money instantly, which means that you can negotiate with your providers on a dynamic discount kind of approach. And that's that's something that's going to roll out within the next two or three days, two or three years, and it's going to be very interesting to see. And you guys are going to be well positioned. Um, oh, we hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A um, co couple minutes here as we wrap this up. Um, how has a public? How have you been able to engage your community, educate them, market kind of public mint, um, encourage developers? Right. These like, and you mentioned this to Ethereum. Like, these are kind of the the, the critical important factors. A bunch of other chains are doing doing their thing um you know carrying momentum but ethereum has a lot of resources content material right H how do you um engage kind of the the public mint uh ecosystem to to further adopt and and you know encourage them to to, to develop and 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 use the platform more again it's 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 a, a challenging um, exercise that we're very happy to address which is as follows so we have, um, for example, for the Earn app, we have people that uh, uh, entered in the IDO, that uh, invested in the Mint token, and we're very happy to have their support. But it's at the same time, you need to try to, for one side, manage the expectations of a quick buck, and on the other side, educate people for the long run. And and that's what we always try to say to people. We're, we're in it for the long run. We want really make this a successful project for years to come it's not just a, well i've been in the first ico bubble yeah. and i've i've seen a lot of things that were really <laughs> crazy. that was crazy that was crazy crazy time and you still have those crazy times today yeah, so what crazy. i'm trying to say here is that things don't happen overnight so you have you have to wait for 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 things to settle and to evolve 
in a sustainable manner. And that's what we're trying to do. At the same time, trying to manage the expectations of our, of our investors and trying to figure out the best way to bring value to them. But it's, it's, not easy, it's, it's not an easy task on these days because you have people going into DeFi protocols, yeah, yeah. winning 100x on two days, and then they want everything to give them 100x in two days. So does it, does it, does it, yeah, it's hard to manage. Ex you have to bring people back to reality, set the expectation, you know, that that's very high oh, risk. And, and explain, explain what we're trying to do here. Exactly. Right? The Earn app is just the beginning. It's just the first of many to be running on top of public mint. And as I, as I said before, first end users, then the corporates, and then we will get to the, to the big, big players out there. No, I mean, I think uh, you're adding value. I think um, you're contributing, you know, to what, you know, the reaching the next billion people, you know, or whatever in the yeah. rest of the world. And, and, um, and, and, and you guys are doing a hell of a job executing along the way from yeah, and one of the things is really to as, as you said execute we need to stick to the roadmap execute create trust people need to understand that we're we are here to deliver and not just for the quick buck that's that's what we plan to do and I, I think you met and i think you just mentioned it uh coming up on the horizon you're doing you're doing an android app uh do you have any yeah. other any any other um you know things on the radar that that uh, we should be yeah, on the lookout at this, for. At this point, is is um, so we have the euro, the the dollar already available, and now the earn app. Then we will we'll get into other currencies. Nice. And that means not only fiat but also uh, the ability to integrate with a stable coin. Great. Which means once again that whether you are on the legacy side or you're on the blockchain side you have an easy way to bring money into the system and start and uh, start using it. So not only fiat currencies, but we will have some integrations with, with stable coins to enable the ability for even for people that are in the crypto space to easily uh, get onboarded into public mint and be able to use their wallets. Nice. That, nice. That's, that's the next steps. And, and those are the, the, the most uh, urgent ones that we need to focus right now. No, that's great. You know, it, this has been a great discussion, eye-opening, um, definitely unique, right? Like I, I, we've, I've chatted with a bunch of projects over the last nine, 10 months and everybody, you know, is doing their own thing, but nothing like public men at all. Um, well, we, we, don't, we don't have the resources of consensus mm -hmm. <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. But, but, but we, what we really try to... to to achieve here is really the, to engage with the community. And, and the thing that we've tried to develop right from the start is really the ability, the ability to make it easy for anyone to develop their own solutions on top of programmable money. So again, as I said, yeah. we, have an open, we have an open API, we have an embeddable widget, which, can, which is kind of like a, a PayPal widget that you can yeah. put on your uh, web portal and boom, you have, you have an ability to, to have a fiat rails with KYC embedded for, for, for customers that want to bring money from the legacy system, that, that is available for people to use. And at this point, it's, it's practically free. So we're engaging with the community and bringing more and more people in to, for them to understand the, the advantages and to try it out in our sandbox. That's, that's our current uh, approach is really to, because it's not just about us, right? It's about the community. It's about bringing use case. We have some ideas of use cases that might make sense, but those are our biased ideas, right? Yeah, yeah. If you talk, if you talk about NFTs, for example, man, we've been talking about people with around NFTs, and they they all say the same. NFTs, uh, if they could be listed in fiat currencies, it would be a lot easier for people to 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 use them. If they could pay it with fiat instead of going through the motions and friction of crypto, that would be a lot easier. So bring them on. And develop them on top of public mint. That's that's. No Do you offer it. any bounties or grants or any kind of programs for developers, incentivize developers to come, kind of maybe propose these on ideas a, a, or, or work with on, you? On a, on a case by case approach, yeah. we might consider yeah. if we see that it's really a very interesting use case that yeah. can bring liquidity and usage really quickly. We would yeah. we would support that. Yeah. 
That's great. And, and, and where can uh, people learn more about public man? Where should they go? How do they get updates and, 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 and insights? Well, you, you have our telegram group, uh, public mint and you have our, our website public mint.com uh, and you have public mint.io which is our developers portal when you where you can find all the the documentation and and access to the sandbox you can even check out the explorer the public mint.com which is our our uh, blockchain explorer where you see all the transactions happening nice. so all there for you to see great great well it's been a pleasure. Uh, we've well, my pleasure. Thank yeah, you for the, the invitation, man. This was a great discussion for everybody tuning in. We just chatted with Paulo Rodriguez, CEO of Public Mint. We got an introduction to the platform, the app, uh, the hybrid approach of, of providing uh, an awesome solution for CFI and DeFi um, opportunities for, for its own users. How we bridge from fiat to crypto. I mean, the, the list goes on. We chatted about governance and kind of the strategic utility of, of leveraging blockchain for for a specific purpose, um, and and I hope you know everybody you know learned something new today. You know, feel free to check out Public Mint. Uh, make sure to go develop on it, uh, go read up on it, and you know let's uh, let's get let's reach the next billion people. So, Paulo, again, thank you for tuning in to Reimagine, participating. Um, you know, we hope to have you again, someone from your team to kind of do another follow up uh yeah. you know in the future and kind of uh, and touch base thank you for your kind words it was a pleasure thank you all right everybody uh thank you for tuning in to game of chains uh, battle for the throne uh my name is adam host today from mousebell team uh, joined here by paulo rodriguez from public Mint, ceo great discussion check them out and uh, we hope you enjoy the conference we'll talk again see you guys all right paulo